is in Mumbai. However, nearly it's been 35 years since the epidemic appeared in India. The disease has not reached the proportions which was predicted by experts across the world. And the AIDS-related deaths have been declined by 54% since the year 2007. So all this is mainly because of the newly advanced HIV testing strategies. So today we will be discussing about the HIV testing strategies and algorithms by Dr. Sangeeta. She is the consultant microbiologist at Manipal Hospital, Whitefield. She has completed her MD microbiology from B.R. Ambedkar Medical College. She has vast experience in the same diagnostic and academic field of microbiology. She has several publications at both national and international level. Now, I request Dr. Sangeeta to start over the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vidya. Uh, th thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, so, I think you have already given a brief introduction about HIV AIDS. Uh, so that makes my job easier. Uh, so now let me take it forward. Uh, so I'll be sharing my screen. I am not able to share my screen. Now that I'm pressing, uh, it's only your entire screen, but the share button is not working. Present now, no? So you press present now, your entire screen. Okay, uh -huh, yeah. yeah. Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Uh, so today I will be talking about the various HIV testing strategies. Uh, so before going into that, we all need to know what is uh, morphology of the virus, what are the various genes or the proteins you are going to detect. Uh, so we will start with the morphology. Uh, so to understand the morphology of the HIV virus, it is a spherical virus around 80 to 100 nanometer in size. It is an envelope virus, you can see here. Uh, the envelope is actually made up of a lipid part and a protein part. The lipid part is actually derived from the host. Whereas the protein part, it has uh, two. One is an oblique structure, which you can see here. That is the GP means a glycoprotein. The number what you see here, it is actually the mass antimodantin, so the protein. So you can see here, this is GP120. That is a docking glycoprotein, which helps the virus to attach to the cell on the T cell. And this is the, the GP41, which is the fusion. Protein which can why then the next positive sense strip are the two RNA. Now again we have some viral enzymes which are very characteristic of HIV virus that is the reverse transcriptase enzyme, the integrase enzyme and the proteases enzyme, the function of which, which I will be discussing in the further slides. Now coming to the genes uh, uh, of HIV and the various antigens which are coded by that, we have three genes that is the, which are known as the structural genes. So that are the GAD gene, the pol gene and the envelope that is the ENV gene. So the GAD gene, it is actually expressed as a uh, precursor pro protein that is P55. So you can see here the GAD gene is actually responsible for the uh, coding the matrix antigen which is P18 or P17 we call it and it is the icosahedral, the nucleocapsid that is a P24 antigen. You, can, you have heard of the P24 antigen which we use for diagnosing HIV. So this is a P24 antigen which we uh, are going to uh, diagnose. So you can see here this is a matrix protein which is a P18 or 17 and here this is the P24 and 15 which actually they constitute the core antigens. Now next is a pole gene which actually codes for the viral enzymes which I discussed in the previous slides. So these pole uh, gene that is also expressed as a precursor protein 
and it is cleaved into proteins P31, 51 and P66 and each one of them they code for uh, reverse transcriptase, the integrase and the protease enzymes. Now coming to the enveloped genes, uh, the enveloped genes they code for the enveloped gly glycoprotein again expressed as a precursor protein that is GP160 which breaks down into GP120. I have already discussed that is a knob-like structure which helps in binding the uh, virus to the cell and the GP41 which is the fusion protein. So these are the three genes which uh, form the structure of HIV virus. Now there are other non-structural genes which like the TAB gene which enhances the expression of the uh, HIV viral genes, the negative factor gene, the regula regulatory genes, VIF, VPO, the VPX which are the non-structural or the regulatory genes. Now coming to the classification of HIV virus. So based on the sequences of the enveloped uh, genes, the sequential uh, differences in the enveloped gene, we have two HIV that is one is HIV1 and HIV2. HIV-1 is more prevalent in India and that HIV-1 is again divided into three groups that is group M the major group which is a more predominant group, N is the new group and O is the outlier group. So in that M is the predominant group which is again divided into nearly 10 clades which also includes the circulating recombinant forms. Even HIV-1 is also divided into uh, groups nearly 8 groups are there of HIV-2. So now coming to the pathogenesis, uh, so we need to understand this so that each part when I discuss about the different diagnostic aspects, you need to know uh, what are the different parts and how is the pathogenesis of the virus. So you can see here the HIV virus when a person gets exposed to HIV virus, you can see here the particular receptors that is the CD4 receptors which are there on the macrophages or the CD4 T cell uh, lymphocytes. So they bind with the GT120, they bind to the CD4 receptors. So after binding the, C, the GP41, the protein, that is a fusion protein that helps in fusing the virus to the uh, cell membrane. And once it gets attached, it helps in uncoating of the virus. And you can see the RNA of the virus coming out. Uncoating is happening, the RNA has come out. Now I have told about the reverse transcriptase enzyme which is present in the HIV virus. Now this reverse transcriptase, it transcribes the RNA into DNA and then one more strand of DNA is formed and this double stranded DNA, it gets into the nucleus of the host cell where it gets integrated with the uh, host cell nucleus and it forms the provirus. So this is called the provirus DNA where here this is the stage where the HIV maintains in a latent period. You know that HIV it maintains a latency for a very uh, 7 to 10 years. It may remain in the latent stage. So when it remains in the latent stage, it exists as the provirus. The DNA gets integrated with the host cell nucleus and it remains as a provirus. But certain differences from other viruses, though this is in a period of latency, the virus can actively multiply. So once the DNA gets integrated, the provirus, next, this viral DNA, it transcribes and forms various viral proteins and even the viral RNA which comes out of the nucleus, you can see here the viral RNA it is coming out of the nucleus and again the mRNA have, translates into various proteins which finally forms a virus and it butts out of the cell even it causes lysis of the cell and it comes out and new viruses are formed and it is ready to infect other CD4 cells. So this is a pathogenesis of uh, HIV virus. So now coming to the various modes of transmission, the uh, most uh, risk of transmission worldwide is majorly because 90 to 95 percent uh, risk is because of blood transmission. Parent to child you can 20 to 20, uh, 40 percent, sexual uh, intercourse 0.1 to 1 percent, even injection drug, drug abuse can cause transmission of the virus, needle stick exposures can cause transmission of the virus. When you look at uh, in Indian statistics, the maximum 88.9% of the transmission occurs because of uh, sexual intercourse. So viral load is maximum in uh, mainly blood and the genital secretions. It is uh, usually variable uh, in breast milk and saliva, zero to minimal in other body fluids or urine. Saliva may contain some inhibitory substances like fibronectin or glycoproteins which actually prevent the transmission of the virus. 
So now coming to our main topic of uh, today's discussion is laboratory diagnosis. So once we understand the uh, structure of the HIV virus and the various pathogenesis of the virus, now it will be easy for us to understand what are the various diagnostic aspects. So when we need to talk about our laboratory diagnosis in adults and children more than 18 months, there are two strategies. Mainly one is the detection of antibodies to HIV 1 or 2 and detection of various uh, virus or the viral products. So what are the different methods for detection of antibodies? We have rapid test, ELISA based test and western blot which detect antibodies to uh, various. It can be either to the P24 antigen or to the envelope antigens we can detect antibodies. Now next is the detection of virus by mainly RNA methods or DNA methods and we have uh, PCR methods and detection of the viral products that is P24 antigen det uh, detection. So each one we will I will be elaborating in the future studies. Uh, so before that when uh, we go into the laboratory aspects we need to know what is uh, the usual uh, time course of immune response, what is the period of viremia and how does the disease progress in a patient with AIDS uh, who is untreated. So here we can see the uh, uh, immune response. So the various stages of HIV is first when the patient gets infected. It is the acute infection phase where uh, the virus is attacking the CD4 lymphocytes. It is causing the lysis of the CD4 lymphocytes and where you can see the primary viremia. That is the virus is actually splitting into the bloodstream and causes a primary viremia where the patient initially has a flu-like symptoms. So that is the stage of acute infection. It usually lasts for three to six weeks. You can see here the virus is spilling into the bloodstream. It reaches a peak and then once the immune system uh, starts responding or the body starts developing antibodies, you can see that the viremia is slowly coming down. So this is a period where we can detect uh, the viremia or what are the tests we can detect the virus and even we can detect the viral products like the P24 antigen which can be easily detected during uh, this period. So this usually lasts for a, a moment of three weeks to six weeks where you can see the acute infection stage. So once the antibodies start developing, so you can see from the time of exposure till the antibodies are developing there is a gap. So this we call it as a window period that is usually the uh, it takes nearly three weeks to three months that is a uh, window period for HIV. So nearly from three weeks if you take the three weeks that we call it as the window period. So during this time the antibodies if you are using an antibody test it will not be detecting because the antibodies start developing after the uh, window period that is after three to three weeks to three months that is the time for the window period. So after the window period you can see that the antibodies are rising up and as the antibodies are rising up the level of viremia is usually coming up, coming down. Uh, and to, then this is a period of latency where I said the virus is actually integrating with the cell nucleus and it remains as a pro-virus. So it is known as a period of clinical latency where but you cannot say it as a microbiological latency because I said the virus during the latent stage it keeps on uh, replicating. Uh, so this is a period of latency usually lasts for nearly 7 to 10 years also uh, where the patient can present with progressive uh, lymphadenopathy but he remains asymptomatic. Now next if it is it remains untreated the next stage is the AIDS related complex uh, where uh, you can see the patient uh, having unexplained uh, uh, fever, diarrhea and other oral thrush etc. So if it is still uh, untreated the patient uh, goes up to the full blown AIDS uh, where he develops malignancies, various immunodeficiency uh, diseases uh, and uh, the death occurs nearly 1 to 2 years if left untreated. So you should, uh, so in the later stage again you can see in the later stages of the AIDS where you can see the P24 antigen again peaking up uh, and even the RNA level is also peaking up whereas the antibodies are coming down because your immune system has gone down and you are entering into a full blown AIDS. Uh, so this uh, chart explains what are the importance of various diagnostics tests in various stages of the AIDS. Uh, so when you see uh, this graph, this is a period when you are exposed to the virus. So the earliest uh, method of detection of HIV virus will be to detect the HIV RNA which usually uh, peaks at around 10 to 12 days of infection. You can detect HIV RNA by PCR method. Next, nearly two weeks of the point of exposure, you can start detecting the HIV-1 P24 antigen. 
again from three weeks nearly you can start when the antibodies develop after the window period you can start detecting the antibodies so you can see here the earliest how how are shortening the you are shortening the window period so you can see here the rna which can be detected that is the earliest which you can detect within 11 days of exposure to uh, then coming to the uh, two weeks where you have the hiv p24 antigen so this can be picked up by various four generation analyzers which i will be detected which i will be talking about later uh, next is the three weeks where you have the antibodies developing and you can use the various ELISA platforms which can detect the antibodies. So these are the tests which each stage there is a window period I am again stressing on the point. The window period usually you need to test for a P24 antigen or the virus where the virus only you can detect the virus because the antibodies are not developed. Next coming to the acute infection where slowly the antibodies are picking up. So where you can detect all the P24 antigen, you can isolate the virus. LSA methods or Western blot can be used for antibody detection. Coming to the asymptomatic or the period of latency where you have a little uh, downgrading of P24 antigen, it's best to uh, opt for your antibody methods by LSA or Western blot. In the full-fledged AIDS where it's related complex and AIDS, any of the methods can be chosen uh, because we have all uh, in the body at that time. So now, uh, who are the individuals who can access the HIV counseling and testing services? So we need to know there are two, uh, one is a self-initiated and one is provider-initiated. Self-initiated are those individual, individuals who perceive their risk and need for HIV testing and thus voluntarily approach for testing. Uh, provider initiator is individuals who are referred by a healthcare provider for HIV testing. Uh, for example, all pregnant women, babies born to HIV positive women, untested children of women living with HIV, uh, children who are presenting with suboptimal growth or severe acute malnutrition, patients who present with signs and symptoms suggestive of HIV or AIDS in any healthcare facility, uh, individuals who have faced sexual assault. Before initiating uh, post exposure prophylaxis and as a follow up testing, patients with TB or a presumptive TB, hepatitis B, C, sexually transmitted infections, uh, sexual partners or spouses of people uh, living with HIV, or any other situation where a healthcare provider feels that HIV testing is essential. So these are the uh, uh, which have been listed down by NACO, that is the National AIDS Control Organization. So when we start with the laboratory diagnosis, very important to know that a number of moral, ethical, legal and psychosocial issues are actually associated with a positive HIV status. So we need to take care of three C's while performing any test for HIV. Uh, so that is the consent, confidentiality and counseling. So when it comes to consent, before doing any HIV test, it is mandatory to take a consent uh, from the person who uh, you are going to test for HIV in a return format and also you need to do a pre-test counselling to the patient telling that you are going to do so and so test if it is ELISA, PCR uh, or any other antigen based test. You need to counsel him regarding the various modes of transmission, you need to counsel him regarding the early detection of HIV and what are the advantages of early detection of HIV and what are the various risks involved. Next coming to the confidentiality of a positive result is very much patient name or the word HIV positive should never be written on the report format. Next is uh, post-test counselling which is very much important. So two things are very important, pre-test counselling and consent and also post-test counselling. In the post-test counselling will actually be uh, motivate the individuals. It can be either negative or indeterminate or positive. All the three cases we need to do a post-test counselling where uh, we uh, motivate the individual if they are positive to tell their spouse mutual disclosure and what are the various ways to reduce the risk of transmission, what are the various um, ART centers available, what are the free drugs available uh, and what are the various uh, risk reduction methods like use of condoms, uh, reducing the drug abuse etc. So these three are very important before we start with our lab diagnosis. Now coming to the various platforms which are available. Uh, so this is mainly the NACO guidelines I have taken from. So screening test, uh, NACO recommends uh, mainly doing the screening test. We have uh, supplemental tests and we have specific tests for HIV infection. Uh, so coming to the screening test, uh, they are usually E bar R, that is the ELISA or the random test we have. ELISA platforms usually take two to three hours. We even have rapid or simple tests which can take takes even less than 30 minutes. 
Then next coming to the supplemental test or the confirmatory test, we have Western blot, line immunoassays, immunofluorescence assays. A uh, specific test for HIV infection, that is a confirmatory test, mainly the P24 antigen detection. We have viral culture, uh, HIV RNA test, that is the best confirmatory method. Uh, various RNA detection methods we have. HIV uh, DNA detection, which is mainly useful for diagnosis of uh, pediatric HIV. And also we have tests for monitoring the HIV infection. Uh, they are the non-specific immunological methods like the CD4 T cell count, which we use a flow cytometry method, hypergamma globulinemia, that is we detect the neoptering or the beta to macroglobulin. They are actually macro, uh, markers for macrophage and monocyte stimulation. Uh, these are self-surface proteins, which actually uh, concentration increases uh, at the time of HIV seroconversion, altered CD4, CD8 T cell ratio. So this, these are the tests mainly not for diagnosis. They are mainly used for monitoring uh, the HIV infection. Now coming, uh, each test when you uh, perform, you need to know how to collect a sample, how to store a sample and then go about testing a sample. Uh, so various uh, sample collection method, may, uh, when we discuss about the antigen and antibody, suppose you want to do a test for detecting the antigen and antibody, uh, we mainly use a serum, plasma or cold blood is used. Whereas if you want to do a CD4 enumeration test for monitoring the HIV, uh, you use a cold blood which is collected in an EDTA tube. For DNA or RNA PCR, we have the dried blood spot test uh, or the whole blood which is collected in uh, EDTA. Even there are some at home tests which uh, uh, use the oral swabs but not recommended by Na NACO. It is being used in the Western world but not as such recommended by NACO. Uh, now, coming to the collection and storage of samples, so serum, I will not be explaining it as everybody knows the collection of serum. So the sera here can be stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius in the refrigerator for up to one week. Or for longer storage, you need to keep them frozen at minus 20. When it comes to CD4 uh, testing, you need to remember that 3 ml of blood is collected in an EDTA tube. And once collected, the blood specimen needs to be processed immediately and definitely within a maximum of 48 hours. Uh, during the, uh, this time, the blood specimen needs to be kept at ambient temperature and not in the uh, refrigerator. So you need to focus on what test you are doing and accordingly you need to collect the sample and even store the sample in the particularly uh, mentioned format. Uh, then uh, blood collection for HIV uh, DNA PCR is mainly we use a dry blood spot. Uh, and for if it is for HIV viral load, uh, we can collect the blood that is mainly we collect the, for the plasma. So we can collect the whole blood is collected in EDTA and the plasma should be separated within 6 hours of collection and it can be stored at minus 20. Uh, if you want, uh, there is a delayed uh, transport, you can store it at minus 20. Now first we will be discussing about the ant various antibody detection methods. So the detection of anti-HIV antibodies is the mainstay of diagnosis of HIV. So the various screening assays uh, which we use as I discussed earlier, mainly the RAP ELISA format and we have the rapid or the simple test. So very important to note is that these tests should be of high sensitivity. So according to NACO, high sensitivity, any test which has a sensitivity of more than 99.5% is a very good test for detecting HIV antibodies. Now, uh, so when you come to the sensitivity, it should be able to identify all the true positives. That means it should not miss out any true positive case. Uh, so even if some false positive reactions may occur, should be confirmed the results of a screening test should never be used as a final interpretation of the HIV status as false positive results can occur or even technical errors can occur. So it should always be subjected to confirmatory test. So the various antigens which are used for these uh, screening tests can be HIV-1 specific, I have already discussed. We have P24 that is a capsid antigen, the envelope antigens 120, 160, 41. Uh, even the HIV-2 specific antigen that is a glycoprotein 36 is used. So these are the various antigens which are used for detecting the antibodies. So first let's discuss the ELISA platform. So ELISA is used as a screening test mainly at the blood banks and even the tertiary care centers. It is easy to perform, it is adaptable to a large number of samples, it is highly sensitive, specific, cost effective. Now there are different types of ELISA kits available based on the type of HIV antigens which we are using. So on the basis of the principle of the test, ELISA can be divided into indirect ELISA, competitive ELISA, sandwich ELISA, capture ELISA. So I will not be going into each one in detail. Uh, so one I will be discussing that is the most commonly used, that is the indirect ELISA. 
So you can see in an indirect ELISA, you can see you already know the microtidal plate, the wells. The wells are actually coated with the HIV antigens. So after that, when you add the serum sample, which is having the HIV antibodies, they get bound to the antigen. And after washing, that is to remove the unbound antibodies, we have add the enzyme labeled antibody. And then we add the substrate and the color change is actually detected by your ELISA reader. So this is the microtitre plate which is the, with the positive samples here. So this is a indirect ELISA which is most commonly used in many of the labs. Now I already said some of the tests they may have when you consider any test we need to look into the pre-analytical errors, the analytical and the post-analytical errors. So pre-analytical errors could be in the form of if it is a hemolyzed sample and a grossly lipemic sample, repeated freezing and thawing, contaminated samples and reagents, improperly stored or expired or deteriorated reagents. Analytical errors include the pipetting errors, the improper incubation time and temperature, improper washing procedure. Uh, sometimes you can detect the false positives if there is carryover from the adjacent positive sample, if I keep a malfunction, calculation errors. Post-analytical errors are mainly in the transcription errors. So sometimes we even have false positive and false negative ELISA results. Uh, there are a number of conditions which can lead, that is mainly the autoimmune diseases which can give rise to a false positive result. Alcoholic uh, hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, leprosy, malignant pregnancies. And common causes of false negative include mainly the uh, technical errors. Or uh, the test may be negative, I have already discussed, it may be negative during the window period and even during the end state of the disease where the antibodies are becoming lower. So now uh, when we discuss about ELISAs, there are various different generations of ELISAs. So the first to come up were the first generation ELISAs, now we use the fourth generation ELISAs. So the first generation ELISAs were actually lacking in sensitivity and specificity. They were actually antigens from HIV lysates. I am not going to details of each one. So first, uh, uh, second, uh, third. So till third generation, they were detecting only antibodies. So each generation how it improved, the sensitivity got improved. Uh, so in the third generation, you can see very high sensitivity and it was even able to detect IgM in addition to IgG. Now almost all the labs we use the fourth generation lasers which can detect both the HIV antigen that is the P24 antigen and the antibodies that is IgM and IgG that thereby reducing the window period. So you can see here it is quite evident. You can see each generation of ELISA where the fourth generation ELISAs are here. You can see how the window period is reduced. The first generation was detecting at around 50 days of exposure to the infection and the second generation at around 40 and the third generation at 20. And now we have the fourth generation which detect the P24 antigen because of which we have reduced the window period and we can detect as early as nearly two weeks of infection. So that is the main advantages of fourth generation analysis where we have improved sensitivity and detection and reducing thereby reducing the window period. So now uh, when I discuss about the fourth generation analysis, they are mainly placed on clia or the microparticle agglutination assays. There are various equipments like the abort or the withdraws platforms. Uh, Roche platforms which uh, we can use and they mainly based on clia technique that is a chemiluminescent assays. Uh, so these are the fourth generation uh, ELISA principle. They are based on fourth generation ELISA principle. Uh, they have got very good sensitivity, specificity and they detect the HIV antigen and antibody. And uh, even now we have come across uh, fifth generation ELISAs which in addition to P24 antigen and antibody, they can even differentiate between HIV-1 antigen and HIV-2 antigen. So they are the latest, that is the fifth generation ELISAs. So now after the ELISAs, we have the rapid or the simple test. Uh, they are developed for ease of performance and they have they produce quick results even less than 30 minutes. Uh, so the most commonly used tests in India are the dot blot assays, that is the immunoconcentration, uh, immunochromatography, that is the lateral flow assays, uh, particle agglutination assays using latex, uh, dipstick or the comb tests, which are again ELISA based tests. So coming to immunoconcentration, almost uh, used in all the labs, we have the Prydot system which has the, uh, the antigens which are embedded in a porous membrane and when you add the sample along with the reagents, uh, the sample gets uh, drawn in into the porous membrane and here uh, you have the membrane or the absorbent pad 
where the HIV-1 and 2 antigens are embedded on it. And when the uh, sample along with the reagents pass through it, you can see here, the antibodies are captured onto the HIV antigens which are present on the absorbent membrane. And then when you add a protein A conjugate, it binds with the FC receptor of the uh, HIV antibody and it produces a uh, red color uh, identification which helps in identifying. So here is a case where it is both HIV and HIV2 positive, this is HIV1 reactive and if a control band doesn't appear, it does an invalid test. That is the immunoconcentration method which is the most commonest is a tribal. Now coming to immunochromatography, that is the lateral flow as uh, where we have the antigens which are embedded on a microcellular membrane. So you can see here the sample is added here which are carrying the HIV antibodies and here we have a burgundy, burgundy colored line which actually is made up of HIV antigens which are bound to a conjugate, usually colloidal gold. And here we have test lines, one for HIV-1, one for HIV-2 and we have a control line. So test line here, the HIV-1 antigen is embedded, here HIV-2 antigen is embedded. So as soon as you add the sample along with the reagent buffer, what happens is that the antibodies, they travel, they bind with the antigen which is conjugated to the colloidal gold and this immune complex is captured by this antigen. So suppose if HIV-1 antibodies are present, the antibodies they bind with the antigen uh, conjugate complex, they are carried uh, by capillary action and then they bind here to the antigen uh, which are HIV-1 if it is present or HIV-2 and they produce a burgundy colored line which you can see here. So this is a sample which is positive for HIV-2 and this is a uh, sample which is positive for HIV-1 and always look that you need to have a control band in all the uh, tests. Particle agglutination test not very much used. They are actually uh, the uh, antigens, they are absorbed onto uh, particles like latex uh, particles or gelatin particles. And then when the, you add the antibodies, they bind with the uh, antigens which are coated onto these particles and they form a latex network which is actually visible at some clumps. Uh, dipstick or the comb test, uh, which is again part of the uh, NACO guideline. So here we have, as the name suggests, a comb. It has a comb-like structure with some uh, projections. Uh, so on these projections, we have the HIV antigens embedded, HIV-1 antigen and the HIV-2 antigen. So the HIV comb is actually uh, dipped in the various, nearly six wells are there. In each well we detect, it's kind of an enzyme immunoassay. So here you can see the antigens which are embedded. And when you add the sample, uh, the antibodies, they bind to the antigen on the comb. And the next step, when you add the enzyme labeled conjugate, the antibodies which are enzyme labeled, when you add to them and then you wash it and then you add the substrate, again it gives a color, almost similar to our ELISA platform. So these are known as a comb test and here again you can see the control uh, dot and here you can see the sample which is positive for HIV-2. So these are the comb tests which are uh, available as rapid tests. Now here again I have discussed some newer tests like the ORA quick antibody test. It is actually an in-home uh, in test which can be done at home. It is the only FDA approved test for performing HIV testing at home. Uh, it actually involves collecting an oral uh, sample with a test device at home, uh, placing the test device in a text kill and uh, it contains a developer solution. And again, you can read the results in 20 minutes. But this test is not recommended by NACO uh, because in-house test it lacks all the counseling or the consent form. So, uh, usually not uh, recommended by NACO as of now. Uh, one more rapid point of care test is the HIV 1 or 2, the antigen antibody combo test, where even you can use a finger stick, uh, finger prick sample, and the, this immunochromatography test can even detect HIV 1 antigen. Uh, in addition to HIV antibodies. So these are the rapid point of uh, care tests which are uh, being implemented. Uh, so now almost we have finished with the rapid test, ELISA test. Now next we are going to the confirmatory or the supplemental test. Uh, so in that, uh, the first is the Western blood test. Though they are highly specific antibody detection methods which are used for validation of positive results of your screening test. They are quite expensive, labor intensive and they need expertise to interpret and they even give uh, unequivocal or indeterminate results. So in that Western blot is the most commonly used test which is recommended by NACO. So here it detects the individual antibodies in serum uh, 
uh, separately against various antigenic fragments. Uh, so we have uh, various gene products which are embedded on a nitrocellulose uh, paper. Uh, so the antigen antibody complexes, they appear as distinct bands on the nitrocellulose strips. So here you can see this is a nitrocellulose strip on which we have the different antigen uh, embedded on the nitrocellulose paper strip. So here we have the GP16120, this is mainly the proteins for the uh, envelope proteins and here we have the pol proteins that is mainly responsible for integrase, uh, the uh, reverse transcriptase, protease and here we have the GAP proteins which are responsible for the capsid protein etc. So accordingly when the antigen, uh, you can see here the HIV antigens are embedded on the strips, when you add the HIV antibodies they get bound to this. Again, you are adding an enzyme, antibody enzyme conjugate and you add a substrate and then you can see the various bands appearing. So, these are the various gene products according to HIV-1 and also HIV-2 uh, Western blot assays. Uh, so, accordingly, you can see the bands appearing on the uh, microcellular strip. So, how to diagnose whether it is positive or a negative? So, WHO has uh, prescribed a criteria where it says that you should have presence of at least two envelope bands out of GP120, 160, 141. They are all the envelope proteins. Okay. So, presence of at least two envelope bands with or without GAG or pole. GAG, these are the pole and these are the GAG proteins. So, with or without GAG or pole bands is taken as positive. Whereas CDC criteria says the presence of any two out of P24, P1, uh, GP120, GP160, GP41 bands is taken as positive. So most commonly we use a WHO criteria for diagnosing a positive Western blot test. So now uh, the other test which is not so commonly used is uh, the detection of P24 core antigen. I have already discussed this is a nucleocapsid protein which is a P24 core antigen. Uh, so here uh, I have told that the P24 it becomes uh, uh, detectable usually after two weeks of infection and lasts for nearly three to four weeks. Uh, thereafter again it is elevated during the end stages of uh, AIDS disease. Uh, less sensitive. Uh, why it is less sensitive is because the antigen, the P24 antigen is usually always bound to the uh, P24 antibody and therefore it uh, remains as immune complexes. So because of which we cannot detect the P24 antigen. So, we, But recently we have some antigen dissociation assays uh, which uh, involve the pretreatment of serum uh, which liberate the P24 antigen from the immune complexes so thereby increasing the sensitivity of the uh, test. So uses of P24 antigen again for confirmation of diagnosis of HIV. Uh, diagnosis of HIV during the window period where the antibodies uh, cannot be detected. Even to diagnose uh, late stage HIV or AIDS, uh, even it can um, uh, monitor the progress of HIV infection. So the next platform is the uh, PCR, that is a polymerase chain reaction where we detect the viral RNA or the viral DNA. So the, I have already mentioned that HIV is a RNA virus. So where you are detecting the HIV, that is a viral RNA genome, which is a gold standard method for confirmation of HIV diagnosis. So here whereas we have various formats available, that is the RT-PCR. So RT-PCR means reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. So reverse transcriptase, why it is mentioned? Because HIV is an RNA virus. So the reverse transcriptase, it actually transcribes the RNA into DNA. It forms then a double stranded DNA is formed and this DNA is amplified by the PCR. So that is why it is known as a reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. There are other methods like the branched DNA assay, the nucleic acid sequence based amplification or the real time RT-PCR which is mainly used for quantification of the uh, viral RNA for estimating the viral load. So apart from the routine diagnosis of HIV, RNA has several uh, detection, has several other uses such as it is the most sensitive and the specific method detects even few copies of viral RNA and it is the best method for confirmation of uh, HIV. So you can see here the HIV RNA detection, you can see the HIV in different stages, you can detect as early as 10 to 11 days where you can see the HIV RNA, it is peaking up. So the best tool for diagnosis is HIV during the window period, it can detect HIV even earlier than any other method available. Uh, one more use is you can use it for uh, viral load monitoring, that is a real-time RT-PCR. It can quantify the viral load and is the most appropriate tool for monitoring the response to the antiretroviral uh, drugs. 
even uh, we can do typing rt-pcr uh, it can differentiate between hiv1 and 2 infection and detect the specific genotype or the subtype and also there are various uh, pcr platforms which are available for uh, detecting the drug resistant genes uh, in patients who are already on treatment for ART. Now, one, the next one is a DNA PCR. So, as I mentioned, it is a RNA virus. So, you may be wondering why it is you are doing a DNA PCR. So, PCR detecting the proviral DNA is extremely useful. So, you can see here, I mentioned earlier that the RNA it gets transformed mainly because of the reverse transcriptase enzyme in the present in the HIV virus. It gets transformed to the DNA. The DNA gets integrated with the uh, cell nucleus, and this is known as a provirus. So, this proviral DNA can be detected by using uh, DNA PCR methods. So, this test is mainly used for diagnosis of pediatric HIV and even to differentiate latent HIV infection from active viral transmission. As you can see here, the latent uh, infection is where the virus remains as a provirus. So, it can help you in differentiating whether the patient is in a latent period or in an active viral replication period. It is also useful during the window period uh, to detect early uh, HIV infection. So next is a virus isolation method, not very commonly used. So isolation can be done from blood or tissues. Uh, there are two methods, a direct or indirect method where we uh, use a co-cultivation method. And after that, we uh, take the viral, uh, that is a supernatal fluid, and we detect the HIV antigen either by PCR or by syncytial uh, uh, formation or by immunofluorescent methods where you can detect the HIV, anti uh, uh, HIV virus. But this is not commonly used because it is quite stringent, it requires high bio biosafety containment facilities, etc. So, not so commonly used. Now, next is some of the tests which are used for monitoring the HIV, that is the CD4 T cell count, uh, which has helped in assessing the risk of opportunity infection, initiation of RF antiviral therapy. Uh, so, even we have the abnormal proteins such as the neoptamine, uh, beta 2 microglobulin, uh, which actually they are actually uh, stimulated by the interferon gamma, which in turn are produced by the HIV activated T cells. So, these tests are mainly used for monitoring the uh, HIV disease progression or even uh, as a response to antiviral therapy. Uh, so, coming to some of the na uh, NACO st uh, strategy for HIV diagnosis, uh, so uh, the NACO has formulated a strategic plan for HIV diagnosis. So, depending upon the situation or condition for which the test is done, the positive result of the first screening test should be either considered as such or confirmed by another one or two screening tests. So, when we discuss on the different algorithms, so, you need to understand that the first screening test that you are going to use should be highly sensitive. That is, it should be able to detect the true positives. It should not miss out any true positives. So, this is the uh, first major uh, principle what you need to uh, remember. So, the first screening test should be highly sensitive, whereas the second and the third screening test which you are using should be of high specificity. So, the three screening tests and also uh, one thing to remember is the three methods which you are going to choose should be using different principles or they should be using different antigens. The same kit should never be used again. Uh, supplemental or confirmatory tests should be used only when the screening test results are indeterminate. So, I will be showing you the different algorithms which we use. So, according to NACO, we have uh, three algorithms. Uh, so, one is the first strategy that is algorithm 1. This is mainly used for transfusion or transplantation safety. So, here we generally used, it is a one test kit. Uh, if the first, uh, the first test, which is highly sensitive test, which should be able to pick up all the true positives, this should be used and once this test is positive, the blood sample or whichever the donor sample is considered positive and you need to immediately destroy the unit of blood as per the guidelines and you can refer the patient to the ICTC for confirmation of his status after taking consent. Now, if the test is negative, the, it is considered negative and you can use the, uh, uh, the blood sample for transfusion. Now, next is strategy 2A, which is mainly used for surveillance you know, to find out the prevalence of HIV in a population. So, here we use two test kits. So, the one test, if it is positive, we do a second test. If both the tests are positive, we report it as positive. Whereas, if one test is positive and the other is negative, we report it as negative. If a single test is negative, it is reported as negative. So, this type of HIV is actually anonymous and it is not linked to any uh, person. We don't reveal the identity. It is just for prevalence, study of prevalence. 
Now, this test for uh, diagnosing HIV infection is mainly the algorithm 2B and the algorithm 3. So, now coming to the algorithm 2B or the strategy 2B, it is mainly used for diagnosis of an individual with AIDS indicator disease with symptoms. So, in a symptomatic patient, if a healthcare provider is thinking the patient is having any AIDS defining disease or symptoms suggestive of AIDS, we need to go about algorithm 2B we need to follow where we use two or three test kits so I have again stressing on the point the first test should be highly sensitive whereas the second and third should be highly specific and they should be even able to distinguish between HIV 1 and HIV 2 antigen. So when coming to the highly sensitive test you can see the first test if it is positive if it is negative you can report as negative but if the first test is positive go about doing a second test if both the tests are positive, you can report positive with a post-test counseling. Now suppose first test is positive and the second test is negative. You need to do a tiebreaker test that is a third test. Now coming to the third test, if first test is positive, second negative and the third is positive, we call it as an indeterminate or equivocal. Uh, so in indeterminate cases, testing should be report, repeated on a second specimen which is taken after 14 to 28 days. In case the serological uh, results continue to be indeterminate, then the specimen is subjected to western blot or PCR if uh, facilities are available. Now, when you consider the first test positive, the second and third test are negative, you report it as negative because the first test which you used is highly sensitive, so it could have been a false positive. So that is why these two negative, uh, these two tests, the last two, which are highly specific, so since these two are negative, we report it as a negative. So now coming to algorithm 3, this is mainly used for detecting HIV in asymptomatic individuals. So here we again use a three test kit strategy where we have the first test, if it is positive we detect, uh, we go for doing a second test. If both the tests are positive, we do a third test. And we do a third test and these three tests should be positive to tell it as a positive case. Now here A1 positive, the second test positive but the third test is negative. We give it as an indeterminate, again testing repeated after 14 to 28 days. Now next, if first test positive, second is negative, we perform a third test. Again, first test positive, second negative, third positive, we give it as indeterminate. And if first test positive, second test negative, third test negative, we need to go about thinking if it is a high risk case, you can consider it as indeterminate. But if it is a low risk case, you can consider it as negative. So these are the various algorithms which are recommended by NACO for surveillance, for screening and for diagnostic purposes. Now coming to monitoring, I have already discussed. So these are the various timelines which we need to use according to NACO. We test every uh, year for uh, viral load and we test every six months for the CD4 T cell monitoring. Now coming to uh, a little bit uh, stress on pediatric HIV. Uh, so here uh, the routine screening test what you need to remember is they detect the IgG antibodies. So here if you are thinking about diagnosing in an infant, the infant could have acquired the IgG antibodies from his mother. So uh, they cannot differentiate between the baby's IgG or the maternally transferred IgG. So antibody detection is not considered uh, for diagnosing pediatric HIV. Uh, so, uh, when uh, you can see uh, the maternal antibodies, they usually disappear by around 18 months. So, therefore, IgG assays are usually performed after 18 months of birth. So, the recommended methods what can be used for pediatric HIV are HIV DNA detection. That is the most recommended method. HIV RNA detection can also be done. P24 antigen detection. IgG allies are only after 18 months of age. So this is the protocol which is recommended by NACO for, uh, so when you have a baby, if uh, determine the age, if it is less than 18 months, 6 weeks, starting from 6 weeks, uh, you can do the, uh, you can collect the dried blood spot uh, for HIV DNA. It's very much useful for the infants because it is very easy for collection. Uh, just break the heat and you can take a little bit of blood on a Wattman filter paper. Uh, so then it uh, and allow it to dry for four hours. It can be transmitted in a Ziploc pouch to the center which is doing the uh, DNA test. You can send the sample HIV detected. It is positive. If it is positive, you again collect one more uh, dried blood spot uh, sample for confirmatory HIV PCR. And again do the PCR. If it is detected, the baby is declared HIV positive. If it is not detected, uh, the lab will request for another dried uh, blood spot for second confirmatory HIV ELISA. 
and again uh, the protocol continues after 6 months you can use a routine protocol that is the detection of hiv antibodies by using the uh, all the three serological test and then also doing a dry blood spot test for hiv uh, dna pcr so this is the workflow for detection of hiv and uh, pcr uh, for uh, an infant from 6 weeks starting from 6 weeks uh, you can start the dry blood spot dna pcr test and then last is the diagnosis of HIV in window period. Uh, so window period I have already mentioned. It is a period where the antibodies do not, uh, de de they cannot be detected. Uh, so during this period we have the HIV DNA or the RNA PCR assays and we can even detect by the P24 antigen detection assays. So to summarize, uh, we need to know what we are doing a HIV test for. So suppose we are doing it for screening for blood and blood uh, product safety, uh, whether you are using for diagnosing HIV infection in a clinically suspected case, or you are voluntary testing after counseling, or it's just for epidemiological surveys, or it is for a research purpose. So accordingly, you need to uh, strategize uh, what algorithm you need to use. Uh, so now when you choose a screening assay, that is a main commonly used test, so in a lab you need to look into the sensitivity of the test kit you are using, the specificity of the test kit, what is the prevalence of HIV infection in your population, what is the cost effectiveness of these kits if you implement this in your lab and what is the appropriateness of testing, you should abide to the national guidelines that is an ACO and you need to have the uh, particular infrastructure facilities which are available and also not to uh, this one forget is the uh, quality assurance which you need to maintain in your lab. You need to regularly monitor your uh, internal QCs. You need to do uh, even ILCs and ICOAS to maintain the uh, quality in your lab regarding the HIV uh, testing practices. So, uh, thank you uh, one and all. So, this is in regarding the HIV testing strategies. Um, there are a few questions in the chat box. A rapid test if positive should be preserved for how many days? So it is actually according to our uh, NABL, any HIV positive sample needs to be stored for a period of seven days. So that is it. Uh, why sometimes L ELISA is positive and NAT is negative? So that is what initially I told you. ELISA could be, uh, there could be three. It could be a pre-analytical error or an analytical error or a uh, post-analytical error. So maybe the may, may, may be carry over uh, by a previous sample which was positive. It could be, the, those are the main reasons why we have a uh, uh, positive ELISA whereas the NAT will be negative in some of the cases. So, so we yeah. follow the same algorithm like uh, yeah. that is That is why we need to maintain an algorithm and you need to uh, look into what are the various infrastructure and what are the testing strategies which are available in your lab and go according which you will be facing it as the first, that is a uh, first test, second test, third test, according to the first is high sensitive test, second and third to be high specific test, so that you don't miss out any uh, true positives. That's all. Okay. Now, uh, next one is for prognostic purpose or following a course of treatment, what is the best method for follow -up? So follow up, I have already discussed, we have CD4 T cell count, we have viral load. So according to NAPO, a uh, patient who is already on ART drugs, we yearly they need to monitor for the viral load, where we look whether it is falling below 500 or below 200 like that. And one more is the uh, CD4 count, where we it keeps on steeply uh, decreasing. So that is also helps in monitoring the progression of the disease. And even other uh, immune, immune markers, I have told this, the neopterin and the beta 2 microglobulin test, which are also markers, where you can detect the progression of the disease, but most commonly used are the viral load assays and the uh, CD4 PCR. Yes. Uh, should retesting should be done in TB or other immunocompromised patients who has been tested initially negative? If yes, how frequently it is done? Uh, can you come again? Retesting should be performed in? Uh, retesting should be done in TB or other immunocompromised patients. Yes, so that is what, when, uh, suppose this is a TB case you come, so it is an AIDS defining illness. So when it comes to AIDS defining illness, that means he comes under a strategy where we use a, a 2B strategy. I have already mentioned. So strategy 2B is mainly for symptomatic. So if a patient is feeling he has a AIDS defining illness like TB, so you go about doing a 3, uh, that is a 2B strategy where we use 3 tests. The first test, if it is positive, we go about doing a second test. 
if both the tests are positive you give it as a confirm positive if one is positive second is negative you go for the third test so this is the strategy which we use for our aids depression with the aids defining illness Um, actually, now there are cases like uh, this complete recovery of HIV. They say, you know, like the uh, one case which was reported in India recently. Also, like uh, what test we usually do for those kind of people for the follow up or relapse? So usually, you should remember that ART uh, the are the drugs that is an antiviral. They don't completely cure the illness. They just help in decreasing the viral load or improving your CD4 count, but they don't completely cure your virus. So it can just extend your uh, Uh, what you say, right. the likelihood of leaving that like they can extend. So that is what mainly the antiviral or retroviral drugs are. So that is what you can help by monitoring. Maybe the CD4 count is improving, and all such tests we can attend that okay, you have a and decreased viral load. So you can say that okay, you can leave for much more years, but it doesn't completely cure it. Or uh, any other questions? 